You might be watching this video on a TV or a tablet, a phone or a laptop, but regardless of the device, the display itself is almost certainly an LCD or an OLED. That LCD is basically a piece of fancy glass with a lot of electronics printed on the surface, and it's attached to the rest of the device with a flexible cable. But making the electrical connection between the cable and the glass is surprisingly tricky because you can't just solder things to glass very easily. The solution to this is both incredibly simple and also something of a technological marvel. And that solution is tape, or more specifically, a special kind of conductive tape that allows electricity to flow in only one dimension. Electricity will flow through the thickness of the tape, that is in the Z axis, but will not flow through the X or the Y axis. This is pretty wild if you think about it. Like, how is it even possible to restrict the flow of electricity like that? So I've got some of this tape, and we're going to look at it today under the microscope to see how it works. I also cut up some actual OLED devices so we can see the tape being used in real applications. So here's the problem in more detail. We have this flexible ribbon cable, which is attached to our electronics board with conventional solder. The cable has, I don't know, a few dozen individual copper traces, which need to be connected to the matching set of traces on the glass. But unlike the ribbon cable, the traces on the glass are extremely thin films of metal. We're talking like a couple hundred nanometers at the most. So you can't just solder to this directly like you would on a normal circuit board. It's simply too thin. And it's also usually a metal like aluminum, which is hard to solder to anyway. You could use something like conductive silver paste or epoxy, but this is tricky because the traces themselves are very narrow and the gaps between them are even smaller. On this cheap, low resolution LED, for example, the pads on the ribbon cable are just 50 micrometers wide, which is a little smaller than a human hair. But as we'll see in a minute, there's also a silicon microchip that's been bonded to the glass. And the chip has electrical pads which are only 30 micrometers wide. And the gap between them is even smaller, uh, about 15 microns. So accurately dispensing an epoxy paste at these tiny scales is, well, it's hard. Like, I'm sure it's doable, but you have to remember that these devices are consumer electronics produced in massive quantities. Manufacturers want a simple, easy, and reliable method to make all these electrical connections. Not something that's fiddly and error-prone, like dispensing tiny drops of silver epoxy. So the solution is to use conductive tape, but not just any tape. We need anisotropic conducting tape or film. Regular conductive tape is nothing special at all, to be honest. This is a roll of copper conductive tape, and it's basically a thin sheet of copper with a conductive adhesive applied underneath. You can touch anywhere on the copper, and it will conduct to the underlying surface, in this case, a piece of metal. But importantly, any two locations on the tape will also conduct. It's effectively conductive in all three dimensions, in the X and Y planes across the surface of the tape, as well as through the Z axis, kind of through the thickness of the tape. And so this just won't work for our LCDs because the tape will connect all the traces together, which is obviously not what we want. So we need to introduce some kind of directionality into the tape. Anisotropic conductive tape uses small metal-coated microspheres embedded in the insulating adhesive. The microscope images of this are really cool, and we'll get to that in a second, but I think it would be helpful to take a look at a demonstration model first to understand how this works at a bigger scale. So in this model, the bottom section represents the glass that we're trying to make connections to. These thin little pads are the metal traces on the LCD screen. And this upper section represents the ribbon cable, and you can see the pads are a little bit thicker. We'll fill the cavity with some of this aloe gel representing the insulating adhesive on the tape. Uh, it's just a thick gel that I had laying around, and it will be used to hold small metal ball bearings. Now all we need to do is press the two sides together. You can notice how the ball bearings get stuck between the pads and form basically like a conductive bridge between the two sides. But in the gaps between the pads, the balls don't make connection with anything, and they're just floating in the gel. And even on the right-hand side, where there were probably too many ball bearings added, they still don't manage to bridge all the way from one pad to another, because they still remain isolated in the gaps. And that's it. That is an anisotropic conducting film. 
The suspended ball bearings allow electricity to conduct in the Z direction between the two pads, but everywhere else the bearings are not touching and won't conduct in any of the other directions. So real ACF uses plastic microspheres, which are coated in a thin film of metal. My tape has spheres which are about three to five micrometers wide and are coated in gold and nickel. You can see the spheres are randomly distributed throughout the film and are actually pretty sparse, which surprised me to a degree. But it makes sense because we want just enough microspheres for them to bridge the pads, but not so many that we accidentally build a bridge between the two adjacent pads. So let's take a look at this in a real world product. This little OLED has two strips of ACF. There's one piece that connects the flexible ribbon cable to the back of the glass. And there's another piece which connects a small silicon microchip to the glass as well. If we look at this under a higher powered microscope, we can actually see the microspheres pretty easily. There are all these little dots that are kind of scattered around everywhere. I thought it would be neat to see this as a cross-sectional view, so I embedded the OLED in some epoxy and then sanded it flat and put it inside of my scanning electron microscope. The flexible ribbon cable is on top here and the glass is on the bottom. We can see all the hollow spheres scattered around the sides and the crushed spheres underneath the copper pad. It's those crushed spheres that are actually making the connection. If we turn on the element detector on my microscope, we can see a few neat features here. So the copper pad is actually coated in a thin layer of nickel and phosphorus, which I wasn't expecting at all. And it probably means it was coated with an electroless nickel plating solution. I'm not sure why to be honest, but I'm thinking it's maybe for corrosion protection. The pads on the glass are very, very thin, but we can see that it's made out of aluminum. And if we look very closely, we can see that the microspheres themselves are made from nickel. Another important aspect is that the microsphere is crushed or flattened. Unlike my demonstration, which used solid ball bearings, ACF spheres are designed to get crushed. This provides more electrical contact to bridge the connection between the two pads, and it makes it a more reliable process. I also made another cross section a little further up, cutting through the silicon microchip. And here it's a similar story, although with much tighter tolerances. The silicon chip is on top here and the glass is on the bottom. The pads and the gaps between the pads are much, much smaller. And the gap between the glass and the silicon itself is also very small. From the optical microscope, we can see that there are only a few microspheres that bridge each connection to the pad, which is actually pretty remarkable to be honest. And all the rest of them that are look perfectly circular, are isolated and non-conducting. Going back to the element detector on the SEM, we can see that the pad is made from gold this time instead of copper. And there's a thin titanium and tungsten layer right underneath the gold. Titanium tungsten is often used in an adhesion layer to help other metals stick better. And it can also act as a diffusion barrier to keep metals from migrating around. The microspheres are pretty hard to see from just a regular photo but are easy to spot when we look at the nickel image. You can also see some of the circuitry of the chip itself. So there are silicon features, aluminum interconnects, and tungsten vias. A lot of these pads seem to be making contact without the help of the anisotropic tape. They're just physically contacting both sides. So in this case, I'm assuming the tape is more of an insurance policy to ensure that all the pads are actually connecting in case there's a specific location that didn't happen to get pressed down all the way. It also provides the adhesion to actually bond the chip to the glass. And if you're gonna be bonding it with some type of adhesive layer, you might as well use the ACF. One of the interesting and honestly sometimes challenging aspects of running a channel like mine is the diversity of hats that you need to wear. Obviously there's the project that's in the video, but less obvious are the other things going on behind the scenes. Filming, editing, lighting, script writing, accounting and finance, graphic design. In the videos, I've done green screen work, object replacement CGI, hand-drawn animations, and for whatever silly reason, I've recently decided to start a science magazine. A YouTube channel is basically like running a small business. 
and at least for my channel, I'm the one that wears all of those hats, which means I need to know how to do all of those things. And that's why a platform like Skillshare is absolutely invaluable to me. Skillshare has thousands of courses across basically all the topics I mentioned. Filming, editing, writing? Yeah, got you covered. Accounting, marketing, graphic design? No problem at all. For this science magazine project, I'm desperately trying to learn how to do magazine layouts and cover design. It's a field that I just don't know anything about right now. And for the channel itself, I'd really like to start doing some interviews and lab tours. But I've literally never interviewed anyone before, and I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous about it. So I have a long list of courses queued up that I'll personally be working through to help get some of these ideas off the ground. The courses on Skillshare are high quality and taught by subject matter experts. And it's a great way to bootstrap a new skill quickly. If there is a new creative or career focused skill you've been wanting to learn, the first thousand people to use my signup link will get a one month free trial at Skillshare. The signup link is down in the video description. Well, I think that's all I've got for you today. I hope that was interesting and I'll see you next time.